Micronutrients are mainly vitamins and minerals. They include iron, iodine, vitamin A, and zinc, which are vital to healthy living. But almost a third of the world's population is not getting the micronutrients needed for normal development, and the results have been devastating. In the past, little attention was paid to micronutrient deficiencies, because people with these deficiencies don't always have physical signs and symptoms. But now we're finding that micronutrient deficiencies impair intellectual development and cause poor health and early death on an almost unthinkable scale. According to the 2004 UNICEF Vitamin and Mineral Deficiency, or VMD, Global Damage Assessment Report, iron deficiency impairs the mental development of 40 to 60 percent of the children in the developing world. Vitamin A deficiency leads to the deaths of up to one million children every year. And iodine deficiency has lowered intellectual capacity in 80 developing nations by as much as 15 percent. Population-based surveys can provide estimates of the severity and magnitude of micronutrient deficiencies. However, those results are only as good as the samples that reach the laboratory for the measurement. Many errors can happen along the way between the collection of the sample in the field, the processing, and the final measurement. It is therefore very important to apply best laboratory practices and great care in these steps so that a valid specimen can reach the laboratory and the study can be concluded successfully. In January of 2000, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention established the Global Micronutrient Laboratory in an effort to reduce the negative impact micronutrient deficiencies are having throughout the world. Procedures and practices are evaluated and standardized in the laboratory to ensure the highest quality of testing results. Over the last few years, the laboratory has helped numerous countries around the world to plan and conduct nutrition and health surveys. Our laboratory provides technical assistance and training for biological sample collection, processing and measurement, as well as various method developments and optimizations for micronutrient testing. In the next minute, we will guide you through a flowchart on blood collection, testing, processing, and shipping. The first step in the sample collection process is the collection of blood from the participant. This is done by collection of capillary blood from the finger or venous blood from the arm. Finger stick blood is typically collected into a purple top microtainer, and venous blood is collected into a purple top vacutainer tube or a red top vacutainer tube. The purple top indicates that the tube contains the anticoagulant EDTA, which keeps the blood from clotting. The purple top tubes are used for tests that require whole blood or plasma. The red top vacutainer tube does not contain an anticoagulant, so the blood will begin to clot immediately. The red top tube is used for tests that require serum. The purple top microtainer and purple top vacutainer tubes can be used to conduct field testing for hemoglobin, C-reactive protein, or CRP, zinc protoporphyrin, ZP, malaria smears, and so forth. Sometimes, with limited volumes, field tests are performed directly from the finger stick blood, and no additional blood is collected into the microtainer. Following blood collection is the processing of the blood. This step usually happens later in the day when samples are transported to a laboratory. Using a fixed volume pipette, blood from the purple top microtainer or purple top vacutainer tube can be used to prepare dried blood spot cards. Blood from the purple top microtainer or purple top vacutainer tube can also be processed to obtain plasma. A centrifuge is used to spin down the blood cells in order to separate the plasma. Similarly, a centrifuge is used to spin down blood cells from the red top vacutainer tube in order to obtain serum. Plasma and serum are then stored in two milliliter labeled cryovials. These cryovials must be shipped frozen. The dried blood spot cards generally require cold shipment. After shipment, the dried blood spot cards Plasma and serum are stored frozen until lab testing for micronutrients occurs. We'll review best practices for each procedure with guidelines that will standardize and simplify our process. We'll also review universal precautions to help ensure your safety while collecting and processing blood samples. The work of the medical professionals today is making an important impact on the health of the world. 
It's very important that these samples be collected properly and in the same manner to avoid any inconsistencies in the test results. The samples you collect are essential for determining whether populations are at risk and whether there is a need for an intervention. Take notes, talk with your teammates, and feel free to come back and watch any of these segments as often as you'd like. The Global Micronutrient Laboratory, just like your laboratory, depends on samples collected by people like you to identify micronutrient deficiencies in developing nations. Now normally, we like to collect blood from the vein to have sufficient amounts for various nutritional tests. But in some situations, the amount of blood you can collect is restricted. Now this could be because of cultural reasons or because the population you are sampling from can only provide a limited amount of blood. There are people that actually refuse to have their blood drawn from their children in their arm. And they're more apt to have their finger uh, pricked for the testing. Collecting capillary blood samples with a microtainer is a minimally invasive way to get the blood sample you need to do a limited number of nutritional tests. Microtainers are made of plastic and can only hold small amounts of blood, up to 500 microliters. Microtainers with a purple top are sprayed with the anticoagulant EDTA, which prevents blood from clotting. This blood can be used for cell counts, malaria smears, hemoglobin analysis, and many other tests that require using whole blood that is not clotted. Some people will provide venous samples, which will be collected using a vacutainer containing EDTA, identified by its purple top. Vacutainers are made of plastic or glass and typically hold between 5 and 15 milliliters of blood. To collect a capillary sample from a finger stick, you will need a lancet, alcohol swabs, gauze, a bandage, a microtainer, powder-free gloves, a sharps container, and a biohazard bag. To reduce the odds that your sample and supplies will be contaminated, as well as to avoid contamination of the work area with blood, place all collection materials on top of a disposable pad, then prepare the patient to collect the sample. Make sure both you and your patient have clean hands. Also make sure that the patient's blood flow will not be restricted by jewelry or clothing. Before collecting blood, put on safety glasses and protective gloves. Begin by turning the patient's hand upward. Massage the hand and lower part of the finger to calm the patient and to increase blood flow. Then scrub the finger with an alcohol swab and dry with gauze. Take the sample from either the middle or ring finger. Hold the finger in an upward position and lance the palm side surface of the finger with a lancet appropriately sized for an adult or child. The most imprecise hemoglobin results are due to poor capillary blood flow. Thus, it is important to make a deep puncture. Press firmly on the finger when making the puncture and apply slight pressure to stimulate blood flow. Wipe the first drop of blood on a gauze pad to stimulate further blood flow. Maintain blood flow by gently massaging the finger while holding it in a downward position. Hold the microtainer at a 30 degree angle below the puncture and try to fill the microtainer to the 250 to 500 microliter level by touching it to the drop of blood. As you collect, remember that time is of the essence. If the collection takes more than two minutes, the blood could become clotted due to insufficient mixing with EDTA. Now you may not be able to see this by eye. If you can't collect the sample you need within two minutes, it's best to stop and move on to the next person. Milking the puncture site may adversely affect test result accuracy. When you have collected your sample, cap the microtainer and gently invert it at least 10 times to prevent clots from forming. This must be done immediately. Don't cap the microtainer and go do something else. Microtainers are sprayed with anticoagulants. Rocking the microtainer back and forth will help the anticoagulants dissolve into the blood. Place the label on the microtainer. If the label contains a barcode, the barcode needs to resemble a ladder when placed on the microtainer. Once you have collected your sample, apply a sterile bandage to the puncture site and properly discard all used materials. 
refrigerate the sample until processing, testing, or shipment. Often surveys take place in very humid and, and high temperature conditions and it's important that the samples are not allowed to degrade. So when you collect these samples you want to keep them cool by putting them in a styrofoam container with a cold pack and when you transport these you want to make sure they stay chilled also. One thing you want to avoid is, is during a lunch break if you leave your samples in a hot car that's going to cause the samples to degradate. Collecting a capillary sample using a microtainer is one of the least invasive ways to get the samples we need to determine whether populations are suffering from micronutrient deficiencies. In our next segment, we'll show you how to use the samples you collected to test for hemoglobin by using the HemoQ instrument. A HemoQ instrument can help you determine if a patient is anemic. The HemoQ is a great instrument because it only takes one drop of blood to perform the test. You want to make sure that you review the operating manuals to learn about troubleshooting should you have a problem with your test results or quality control. A HemoQ instrument is very simple to operate. In this segment, we'll show you how to verify the calibration of the HemoQ instrument, conduct a quality control check, and test a blood sample for hemoglobin. Begin by putting on safety glasses and gloves. Turn on the HemoQ by using the switch on the back of the instrument. The letters HB will appear on the display screen once the instrument is running. Before you measure your sample, you'll want to verify the calibration of the instrument to ensure that you are getting an accurate reading. Each HemoQ instrument comes with a control cuvette, which is used to verify the calibration of the instrument. Check the serial number on the control cuvette against the HemoQ serial number. The calibration verification process ensures the correct optical alignment of your instrument, which is the only way to ensure you will get an accurate reading. Place the control cuvette into the holder and gently push it into the HemoQ instrument. If the control cuvette reads within the range specified on its container, calibration has been verified. If the reading is not within the specified range, clean the control cuvette and the cuvette holder and try again. If you are still not successful, the instrument should be sent back to the manufacturer for servicing. Assuming you have successfully passed calibration verification, you will next perform one of the daily quality control tests before measuring your samples. Use the Hematrol blood products, low, normal, and high controls for this purpose. To reduce contamination, always wear powder-free gloves before handling cuvettes. Cuvettes are stored in a humidity-controlled container. Don't remove cuvettes from this container until you are ready to use them and remove cuvettes only one at a time. Recap the storage container immediately after removing each cuvette. Place a drop from the manufacturer provided hematrol sample on a surface like parafilm or plastic wrap that won't absorb the blood. Fill the cuvette by placing the open end in the middle of the drop. To avoid contamination, it is not recommended to dip the cuvette into the hematrol vial. Before placing the cuvette into the HemoQ instrument, clean excess blood from the cuvette using a lint-free wipe. After 15 to 45 seconds, the instrument will display the hemoglobin result on the screen. Record that number on the quality control results form and check the result against the accepted quality control limits. If the quality control is not good, you want to make sure you check your cuvettes for contamination, either through humidity or the fact that they may be expired. Also, the control material may be bad, so you want to get a new bottle of control. You'll follow the same steps used during quality control when processing your sample. Collect a blood sample using the microtainer collection technique we described in the last segment. You can fill the cuvette with blood from the microtainer, or you can fill the cuvette directly from the finger. Completely fill the cuvette all at once. If you interrupt the filling, you will likely introduce an air bubble, which could give an inaccurate reading. If you don't completely fill the cuvette on the first try, throw it away and repeat the procedure with another cuvette. 
Before placing the cuvette into the HemoQ instrument, clean excess blood from the cuvette using a lint-free wipe. Do not touch the open end of the cuvette with the wipe because it could remove some of the blood in the cuvette. Be sure to inspect the cuvette for air bubbles. Small air bubbles along the edge should not influence the result. Then gently insert the cuvette into the HemoQ holder. You'll notice that the shape of the holder matches the shape of the cuvette and won't allow you to insert it backwards or upside down. It's important to push the holder in gently. If you push too hard, blood can splash out and make the optics dirty. After 15 to 45 seconds, the result is displayed. If you encounter an error message, please refer to your operator's manual. Record the result the same way you recorded the results of your quality control readings. Be sure to dispose of the cuvette, wipe, and parafilm in a biohazard container. You need to perform the quality control at the beginning of the day and at the end of the day in order to bracket your sample results. And this provides good quality control in the fact that you know the results are good in the morning when you start and you know that the results are good at the end of the day when you end. In our next segment, we'll find out how to process whole blood to prepare dried blood spots and how to ship them to a laboratory for testing. In our first segment, we showed you how to collect capillary blood using a microtainer. There are times when you will be asked to prepare dried blood spot samples. Sometimes it's not possible to centrifuge blood or plasma. In those cases, blood spots are a good alternative to use. It's important to know that validation studies are being done for some of these nutritional components. Since they take up very little space, dried blood spot samples are easy to ship to a laboratory where testing can be done. They also take up less room for long-term storage. Dried blood spot samples are useful in detecting iron and vitamin A deficiencies, but they can be used for many other tests. To prepare dried blood spot samples, you will need an approved filter paper, a pipette, and a drying rack or box. Various types of drying racks are available for this purpose. The 1997 NCCLS document, Blood Collection on Filter Paper for Neonatal Screening, specifies which types of filter paper are suitable for preparing dried blood spots. Paper is chosen based on characteristics such as thickness and absorbency. Although dried blood spots can be prepared directly from a finger stick, for the purposes of most nutrition surveys, blood is collected into a microtainer and a fixed volume is then applied to a filter paper card using a pipette. If you are processing blood from a refrigerated sample, allow the sample to warm for a few minutes at room temperature. When you're ready to collect the sample, gently invert it 20 times to ensure complete mixing before it is placed on the filter paper. Most studies call for 100 microliters of blood, since that is the volume that will fill a circle on your filter paper. For some tests, it is possible to use less. Do not touch any part of the filter paper circle before or after the application of the blood. Place spotted filter paper cards in a drying rack or box and allow the blood spots to dry at room temperature for a minimum of three to four hours. Drying may take longer if the humidity is high. It's important to let blood spots dry completely before storage in order to avoid the moisture that can cause bacterial contamination. Do not let the blood dry in direct sunlight. Also, keep the sample away from heat sources. Do not stack the samples or allow them to touch other surfaces during the drying process. Whether your dried blood spot samples are shipped at room temperature, refrigerated, or frozen, depends on the specifications of your study protocol. To prevent degradations of the samples, it's important that these samples be stored in a cool condition. You also want to avoid any freeze-thaw cycles during transit or during storage. Once the samples arrive, they need to be stored in the refrigerator or freezer. Gather all the materials you will need for shipping, including a sealable plastic bag, humidity indicator cards, desiccant packs, a Tyvek envelope or a second sealable plastic bag, and a styrofoam shipper. Visually inspect the blood spot cards. If they appear dry, pack them up. 
Separate blood spot cards with weighing paper to keep the samples from contaminating each other. Pack the blood spot cards in 3 mil thick bags, such as those made of Saranex, to provide a barrier against gases and water vapor. Pack the plastic bag into a second sealed container, such as a plastic bag or a Tyvek envelope, and place into a styrofoam box containing cold packs. Household Ziploc bags should not be used because they will not provide an adequate vapor barrier. Desiccant packs absorb any moisture that may enter the plastic bag. If humidity rises above 30 percent, the indicator cards will change from blue to pink and the card and desiccant packs should be changed. Keep humidity sensitive materials such as indicator cards and desiccant packs in sealed containers until they are needed and only handle humidity sensitive items with gloves. Ship the package to the appropriate laboratory. Be sure to contact the laboratory you are sending your sample to so they are ready to receive the package when it arrives. I'm familiar with a couple of cases where samples were sent to CDC and they were held up in customs because paperwork was not filled out properly. When the samples were received at CDC they were totally useless because of the temperature of the container that they were in. Even if you aren't shipping the dried blood spot cards immediately, you still need to pack the cards as soon as they are dry to control the humidity and avoid contamination. Refrigerate the packed dried cards until they are ready to be shipped. These instructions are for dried blood spot samples. Next we'll talk about preparing and shipping serum and plasma samples. Stay tuned. In the past three segments, we've shown you how to collect whole blood, measure hemoglobin, and prepare dried blood spot samples. But there are analytes that can only be measured in serum or plasma. In these cases, you will need to know how to process whole blood to obtain serum or plasma. As a quick review, if blood is collected in a vacutainer or microtainer that contains the anticoagulant EDTA, the blood will not clot. This blood can be used for cell counts, malaria smears, hemoglobin analysis, and many other tests that require whole blood that is not clotted. If blood is collected in a tube with an anticoagulant and it is spun down, the fluid at the top is called plasma. Blood collected in a red top tube or a container that does not contain EDTA or any other anticoagulant will begin to clot immediately. The blood will clot and be ready for centrifugation in 30 minutes. Centrifuged blood collected in a red top tube is called serum. In serum, all the clotting factors are used up. It's important to remember that vitamins and other micronutrients contained in serum and plasma are sensitive to degradation from light and oxidation. Minimize the exposure of serum or plasma to light, heat, and air. Plasma has a tendency to form microclots which can cause major problems from pipetting. That's why you want to use serum instead of plasma. For serum, allow whole blood collected in a red top vacutainer to clot at room temperature for at least 30 minutes, but no more than two hours. Allowing the blood to sit for a minimum of 30 minutes will lead to a natural separation of the blood cells from the serum. Plasma can be prepared immediately after blood has been collected into a purple top vacutainer. It does not need to sit for any length of time at room temperature before centrifugation. If the processing of blood to serum or plasma is delayed, blood should be kept refrigerated and protected from light to avoid degradation of vitamins and other nutrients. Ensure that the vacutainer tubes are balanced before placing them into the centrifuge. When you are ready to centrifuge the blood, place the vacutainers in a centrifuge holder. Microtainers can be centrifuged in a regular centrifuge using adapters or in a micro centrifuge. Centrifuge the vacutainers for 10 minutes at 2500 to 2800 revolutions per minute. When the centrifugation is complete, the serum will be the liquid in the top portion of the red top vacutainer and the plasma will be the liquid at the top of the purple top vacutainer or microtainer. Pipette the appropriate amount of serum or plasma into a 2 milliliter cryovial. Depending on your study criteria, you may have to prepare more than one 2 milliliter cryovial. 
When filling the cryovial, consider liquid expansion when frozen and do not fill the cryovial past the 1.8 milliliter mark. Make sure to tightly cap the vial for shipping and storage. After transferring all of the serum or plasma, discard the used blood collection materials in accordance with your hospital or lab regulations. Place the cryovials containing serum or plasma into a labeled box for frozen storage. It's important to label your sample properly so the label is legible and the label does not come off the tube. Also, you want to identify what's in the vial, whether it's serum, plasma, or urine, because these three things look very similar when they're in a vial. On each vial, also include your study number and the date and name of the study. Also include information on the analyte to be measured. Once you have prepared your serum or plasma samples, you may need to ship them to a laboratory for analysis. In order to meet the international shipping requirements, it's important to have the proper forms fill out to identify what is in the shipper, if it's infectious or not, and, and how many vials are actually contained. One of the problems that we have is people that are shipping the samples think that it's the receiving people that are responsible for the forms, when in reality the person shipping the sample, it's their responsibility to make sure the forms are filled out properly. Serum and plasma samples will almost always be shipped frozen. It is critical that the samples still arrive frozen at their destination. Since the items are shipped frozen, it's important that you have good communication with the receiver of the shipment to ensure that the samples arrive frozen. Daily tracking of the shipment is advised. Assemble all items for packing and shipping frozen samples, including the specimen box, specimen shipping list, Ziploc bags, styrofoam shipping box, dry ice, and packing material, such as a newspaper or bubble wrap. Make sure the identification numbers on the specimen shipping list match the identification numbers on the cryovial labels in the specimen box. You may want to secure the lid of the specimen box with one or two rubber bands to avoid opening of the box. Then wrap the specimen box with absorbent paper. Place the specimen box into a Ziploc bag and seal the bag. Place the Ziploc bag in the bottom of the styrofoam shipping box and use bubble wrap to ensure that the specimen box does not shift during transport. To keep the samples frozen, fill the styrofoam shipping box with dry ice. Dry ice burns, so protect your hands and eyes with heavy gloves and safety glasses. Allow one pound of dry ice for every two hours of transport. For international shipments, a minimum of 50 pounds of dry ice is recommended. Fill empty space with bubble wrap or newspaper to help keep the specimen box from shifting as the dry ice begins to evaporate. Place the styrofoam lid on top of the shipping box. Do not tape the styrofoam lid shut. The packaging must allow the release of carbon dioxide as the dry ice evaporates to prevent damaging the shipping box and its contents. The styrofoam container is shipped inside a cardboard box. Complete the specimen shipment list and place it on top of the styrofoam lid. Also, remember to photocopy the specimen shipment list and retain a copy for your records. Tape the cardboard flaps shut. Ensure that the styrofoam shipping box remains upright by marking the box on the outside with arrows. Label the cardboard box with a dry ice sticker. Use a pre-printed label or a marker to label each box with the recipient lab address and return address information. Both addresses should include a contact name and telephone number. Remember to contact the recipient lab before shipping the specimens to ensure that the staff is prepared to receive the shipment. We've completed all four steps of collecting blood, measuring one indicator in the field, processing, and shipping blood samples to a nutrition laboratory for testing. Again, the work you are doing is very important in our fight to limit the negative impact micronutrient deficiencies are having worldwide. Well, we've come to the end of our program. The tips we've shared today help standardize the way we collect and process blood samples, which will help us reduce errors as we assess micronutrient deficiencies worldwide. 
The work you're doing in the field is making a profound difference in the lives of millions of people throughout the world. Now before we end the program, we'd like to review a few universal precautions to help ensure your safety while collecting and processing blood samples. At all times when handling blood, you should be on guard to prevent against possible exposure to HIV, hepatitis, and other blood-borne pathogens. Collecting blood is basically a safe procedure. You should remember that each sample could be contaminated and therefore you should handle it safely. For your own safety, wear protective equipment and follow universal precautions as described by CDC guidelines. Standard protective equipment includes eye protection, disposable powder-free gloves, and a lab coat or gown that will protect you in the event of a spill. Also, use retractable lancets, a puncture-resistant sharps container, and biohazard labeled discard bags. Proper work practice controls can also reduce the likelihood of exposure. Proper work practice controls include preventing the storage of food and drinks where blood or other potentially infectious materials are kept, refraining from eating, drinking, smoking, applying cosmetics, or handling contact lenses in the work area. Routinely decontaminating work areas by wiping them down with a bleach solution. Washing hands when gloves are removed and immediately after skin makes contact with blood or other potentially infectious materials. Remember that many micronutrients in blood are sensitive to light and elevated temperature. Never ship samples unless you've contacted the recipient laboratory and they are ready to track and receive the samples. Once again, worldwide recognition that micronutrient deficiencies are having a significant impact on the health of people in the developing world is a fairly recent phenomenon. But the work that people like you are doing is having a positive effect. According to the 2004 UNICEF Vitamin and Mineral Deficiencies Global Damage Assessment Report Summaries, the global prevalence of iodine deficiency has been decreased from 30% to 15%. Approximately 70 million newborns a year are being protected against mental impairment. More than 40 developing nations are reaching 70% or more of their young children with at least one vitamin A capsule every year, saving the lives of more than 300,000 young children each year and preventing many hundreds of thousands of cases of irreversible blindness. In addition to these advances, there are signs that the seriousness and urgency of the micronutrient deficiency issue is beginning to be more widely realized. In 2003, we have seen the launch of the $70 million Global Alliance for Improved Nutrition, or GAIN, program, supported by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the Micronutrient Initiative, and the aid programs of Canada, Germany, the Netherlands, and the United States. Many more developing countries are now starting to fortify staple foods with essential vitamins and minerals. Examples of such fortified foods are flour, salt, sugar, and cooking oil. We will be able to see great progress in the improvement of micronutrient malnutrition deficiencies as a result of these nutrition interventions. The procedures and practices that you will apply when you go out in the field, collect biological specimens, bring them back, and analyze them will really be important to document the success of these interventions. So you will be part of the process and able to improve many, many lives. We hope that you found the techniques presented in this program useful, and we thank you for your dedication to this cause. For more information on CDC's work in the area of micronutrient malnutrition, please visit us online at www.cdc.gov.